Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwensa Garden in Ireland and you are very welcome to this video which is a continuation in my top five series. So today I'm going to collaborate with the up-and-coming Australian channel called the Horticulturalists and the topic of today's video is the top five plants that I can't grow here in my Wexford garden but that Stephen Ryan can in his garden in Melbourne, Australia, and vice versa. So let's get on with the video. In this video, you're going to hear about the top five plants that I grow well here in my Irish garden, but that Stephen Ryan in his Victoria garden just can't grow at all. And then we're going to hop over to the Horticulturalist channel and you're going to hear about the top five plants that Stephen grows beautifully, but I just can't manage. So I guess I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the horticulturalists and Stephen Ryan is a well-known personality in Australia because he has hosted the television series Gardening Australia. He's also holder of the national collection for three plants, Sambucus, Acanthus and Cornus. And if that's not enough, he's published three books on rare plants. Now the other half of the team is the very stylish Matthew Lucas who has an interest in orchids and brings us orchid videos from his stunning Melbourne home. His channel is called Hello Plant Lovers and you should also check that one out. Now this video is very interesting because both Stephen Ryan and myself are technically in US hardiness zone 9, although neither in Ireland nor in Australia do we use this system of measurement. Whereas we can get away with hardiness, the same hardiness level, for me the issue has got to be lack of sunshine and too much water, too much rain. But for Stephen the issue is too much heat in the summer and drought. So, I guess, without further ado, let's hear from the horticulturalists themselves. Hello, I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we are the horticulturalists. We are. And we're based here in my garden at Mount Macedon in Victoria, Australia. We post every week and we do all sorts of interesting things with plants and gardens. And this week we're really excited to be collaborating with Rachel on the five plants that Stephen wants to grow but can't yep. and the five plants that Rachel wants to grow but can't that we can here in Australia and that Rachel can grow in Ireland. So I think without further ado Stephen and I'm keen to hear what your list of five plants are that you wish you could grow here that you can't that Rachel can. We all have those lists by the way because we're or wanting to grow the things that we probably shouldn't. Or can't. Or can't, <laughs> yes. So, so true, Stephen. We all have those lists of must-have plants, and we have a compunction as gardeners to grow what is rare. But if a plant is rare in your particular region, it can be because it's just horrible to grow there. Doesn't stop us, however. All right, Stephen, I'm intrigued. Yes. Number five in the top five countdown of things you wish you could grow here, but you can't, that Rachel can, is? Hepatica. Hepatica, yes. okay. Remind me what that is, because well, I don't know. <laughs> that means you don't need reminding, you need telling. It's a little woodland plant. They come mainly from uh, Asia. Uh, they have small, almost primrose-like flowers on yep. them. The classical colours are in blues and whites, and they're a dainty little plant, but they don't like our hot summers and our dry soils. So that's a double negative. It is a double negative. <laughs> How often have you tried that? <clears throat> well, I can sort of keep them alive in a pot as long as I keep them in a shade house and I keep them watered and so forth, but it doesn't give them any garden context. So okay. I can sort of keep them alive, but just. Okay, Rachel, what are your tips for getting hepatica to thrive? Hepatica is a gorgeous little blue flower that everyone wants to grow because of the colour. Now blue is unusual in nature which makes it all the more desirable. Let me show you one of my clumps just here. This hepatica is finished flowering for the year as it's May, leaving its lobed evergreen leaves on display. 
Hepatica is a woodland plant that needs hummus rich soil with good drainage. It needs sunshine and moisture in spring and shade in summer. Here in my garden it gets both of those things and does well under trees where I don't disturb them. Hepaticas benefit from the addition of some leaf mould placed around the crown of the plant in autumn. And I wonder, might that be something you could try there in Australia? Just after flowering, putting that little bit of leaf mould around the plant, might it help conserve the moisture for your long, droughty summers? Another thing to try is to remove any spent flower stems or leaves because mildew can be a problem, especially when the conditions are dry. So if you remove those, it reduces the likelihood that there'll be a mildew buildup. Also do feed in either spring or autumn with a well-balanced liquid feed. In the wild, hepaticas like to grow beside rivers or streams. And my friend who's from Latvia has given me a vision that's stuck in my mind. She says that in spring, the woodlands are carpeted with blue as the hepaticas come into flower, making it a fantastic sight. Now I know Stephen, you've traveled widely, plant hunted at times. So perhaps Latvia in spring is something to add to your bucket list. It's certainly on mine. This is a tough little plant that tolerates winter cold and in fact needs low temperatures for seeds to germinate. A tip for getting seeds to germinate is to, of course, leave them outdoors, but to actually sprinkle some snow on the top of the pots if this doesn't happen naturally. The two hepaticas I grow here in my garden are Nobilis and Transylvanica, and they grow really well, but the epicenter for hepatica cultivation has got to be Japan where they've been growing them since 1603. Now Japanese hepaticas, if you can afford them, uh, they need to be grown under glass in this part of the world and I really am sorry to say Stephen but that's the best recommendation I can give to you for growing hepaticas in your sunny, look on the good side, your beautifully sunny summer garden. Yeah, pots. The cat down continues. Number four, Stephen, what is number four on the hot list? <laughs> the number four on the hot list is the monkey puzzle tree. Now, this really surprises me because I see them in and around the region. What has been your problem growing them? Well, the problem... What's my, your problem? That's my problem. My problem is that we have a fairly shallow hydrophobic soil uh -huh. and they come from the mountains of South America, particularly in Chile. Oh. And so they have lots and lots of rain. They get plenty of uh, moisture. They get plenty of coolness. They yep. often have snow around them. And it just becomes too torridly hot and dry in the summer to grow them here. They can grow them at the top of Mount Macedon, so quite close by I can go and visit them, mm. but I can't keep them alive in my garden. <gasps> Rachel, what are your tips for growing successfully monkey puzzle trees? This is the moment when I have to come clean and admit that I don't yet have a monkey puzzle tree in my garden. I do have this specimen I've been growing in pots for years and this was grown from seed collected in a garden nearby here where it just flourishes called Woodstock Gardens. Now, I have been waiting for the right moment to plant this spacious tree in my garden because it takes a lot of space and you don't take the planting of a tree lightly. And I also wanted the right occasion and I have to tell you, breaking news, that the occasion has finally arisen. And my first grandson, my first grandchild, was born recently on the 6th of May and his parents have chosen the monkey puzzle tree as his birth tree. So I'm going to plant this tree here in my garden as Moog's birth tree. So welcome to the world, Moog, Joshua, Darlington Rath. And I guess I just like feel quite emotional about it because I never thought I would get to be a grandparent so it's just absolutely wonderful to do it. I have two more things to say about this tree and the first is that this seed grown specimen was given to me, gifted to me by Lynn from Desert Plants of Avalon Channel so thank you very much Lynn, it's going in the ground finally. And the second thing is that the monkey puzzle tree grows in moist 
full sun or part shade conditions here in Ireland at least it does need a deep root run and hummus rich soil so if you don't have those conditions it's going to be challenging and it seems you have very specific localized constraints to growing this tree Stephen all I can suggest is that you know longer term it's not one that can be grown in a pot I mean this thing is 200 million years old this is a tree that was around at the time of the dinosaurs you think it might be a bit sturdy now but what you do know is that it's something very special and something that we do want in our gardens but it needs the right environment personally i try any plant twice if i like it twice in my garden and then if i don't succeed i give up we're getting there Stephen. number three on the hot list of things you wish you could grab uh, are you all right is this triggering you <laughs> it is a bit... you're not a failure Stephen. no no look number I'll, three i'll be good about the other plants that i can grow Number three is Enchianthus, which is a lovely shrub or shrubs uh, yep. that come from Japan, China, in the rhododendron and azalea family. Mm. Beautiful little flowers in the spring, yep. fabulous autumn foliage, yes. and wonderful structural shrubs. Sounds like a must-have. Uh, and it would be a must-have if I could grow it, but unfortunately it has a very shallow root system, mm. and our soils just can't keep enough moisture in them in the summer, so it gets too hot, too dry. Ah, uh, oh, Rachel. And they burn and die. Oh, Rachel, your <laughs> tips for making Enchianthus this thrive. I'm sorry to hear about your trouble growing Enchianthus, Stephen. And here we are in front of mine. And this is, I guess, a shrub or a small tree which does well in an open woods landsy setting. And it's really grown for its bell like flowers that hang down in I suppose early summer so we're in the beginning of May now and mine is in full flower and it's also known for its striking autumn foliage really good color it gets now it's a great plant but it does need certain conditions to do well in a garden setting we've already touched upon the fact that it needs a kind of semi-shade woodlandsy setting it also needs acidic soil so if you don't have acidic soil don't even try to grow this plant <laughs> there are various ways that it's suggested you might make your soil more acidic but really they're too much trouble they're more trouble than they're worth so if you have naturally acidic soil like I do here then do try this it's a good plant to try not that I'm suggesting that that's the problem you have there Stephen with growing this it is shallowly rooted and I think that's the same for all the plants in the rhododendron family or a lot of them anyway and it has certainly touched me in this garden here so the shallow rooting as far as you're concerned gives rise to problems with getting enough moisture in summer whereas shallow rooting in my garden was a real problem in the beginning when it was setting up and rhododendrons I planted lots of them and in the winter I'd look out the window and watch them as they rolled with the wind across the uh, fields beyond and were gone to me sisters as well couldn't keep that in the ground as well but over time what has happened is that a canopy and a shelter belt of trees and shrubs has grown up in my garden and now these plants have enough shelter from the winds to not make off and go on over the fields. Stephen number two da, 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 we're getting close what is the second um, most fabulous thing you can't grow you tried you failed? Uh. Fritillaria meleagris. Fritillaria are the snake's heads. Yes, the ah. snake's head fritillaries. They are stunning little bulbs. I would have thought they'd be great here. Uh, they tend to be, well, it's a combination thing. They get a little bit too dry in the summer, I yep. think. Yep. Uh, but also they're very small and they're very fragile. And we have a lot of marauding slugs and snails in our garden, uh -huh. uh, which can be quite difficult to cope with. And if they get mown off, it weakens the bulbs. They get smaller, they don't perform. Interesting, because now you mention it, actually, I don't think I've ever actually seen them in someone's garden in Australia. So Rachel, how do you make your fritillaria thrive? Ah, oh, no, Stephen, so sorry to hear you can't grow the snake's head fritillaria because it is such a loved one. And I know any kids that visit my garden, they absolutely love the patterning on those drooping bell-like flowers as they hang down, really like a snake skin, which is very exotic here in Ireland because we don't have snakes. Anyway, that's my clump over there and it's finished flowering now at this stage, but hopefully 
setting seed which will scatter around and clumping up nicely although the seed does take a very long time to get to flowering size from seedling. Now what can I say about this? It's a woodlandsy plant I guess similar to hepatica in many ways. It likes moisture, it likes shade, it likes full sun in spring and then in summer it likes shade and I really don't have to struggle to grow this well because it just likes this particular position. Now I think you mentioned that yours tend to get mown off and of course the snake's head fritillaria is a great one for naturalizing in a lawn but you do have to be very careful not to mow it because those leaves they build up strength for the following spring when it's going to flower again and if you cut them prematurely then it just isn't going to flower. You also mentioned how slugs and snails can also be a pest when this little plant is coming up in spring and I just have to tell you the latest from the RHS is that slugs and snails are not a pest if they're indigenous to your area. The only thing that is a pest are things that don't come from where you live. So yeah, that's not much help to us gardeners, is it really? Now, I do have a pest that afflicts my fritillarias and that's the lily beetle because fritillaria of course is in the same family as lilies so those little red beetles just love to munch on the flowers and destroy them a bit but yeah it's something that hasn't really been too much of a problem so far so that's all really i can offer you in terms of growing the fritillaria but you know what i can't wait to hear what your number one plant is Come on, tell me. Drum roll, number one in the hottest five countdown of things you can't grow, Rachel can, is <laughs> poppies. Mechanopsis. They are Mechanopsis. fabulous plants. They come from Tibet and China and they are just exquisite. But they don't like our hot summers and the only way I could grow them is to grow them in pots in yep. a shade house, yep. flower them in the pots, sink the pots in the garden, <sighs> enjoy them for a week and, and then... <laughs> And then they die. I'm sorry, they just don't like our climate. Oh, and I've actually tried to grow them from seed and they got so big and then boop, they just dissolved. So Rachel, tell us how you grow the Tibetan blue poppy. Is that the common yes, name? Yes, that's it. Ah uh, yes, the blue Mechanopsis poppy. It's almost like the unicorn of gardening, isn't it? Everybody wants to grow it for its blue colour, which is almost surreal in a garden setting and it's soft hairy leaves but this is a plant that likes wet hummus rich shady positions and it can be must be far away from any kind of wind and it must never be allowed dry out now you'll probably guess from my description of what it likes that this is a bit of a prima donna of plants and you can grow this successfully in your garden for several years and then for no good reason it just ups and offs and dies and you're left wondering what on earth did i do to offend you in fact, there's a garden not very far away from me called Huntingbrook. And for many years, they had masses and masses of blue poppy there, just swathes of them in spring. The garden was even known for them, but now not a single blue poppy to be seen. And I guess my own experience is similar. So I had a very healthy clump up in a shady position in the garden up that way for many years. It did so well, flowered every year, so happy. and. The funny thing was that it actually self-seeded about, but it didn't self-seed in the ground beside the parent plant. It self-seeded in a gravelly bed nearby, which was built for holding slipper orchids. So kind of really, you know, well-drained. So that was just bizarre because the plant is supposed to like moist conditions, yet the seeds self-sowed in a gravelly area. Now, <laughs> Having said that, you'd think with that kind of success, that plant would have gone on to do great things. It did, and then just one year, they all upped and died. And last year, I decided to just try again. So I bought some more of the blue poppy and I have planted them 
down there in an area in front of my cardiocrinums where it is sheltered and hopefully the plant will get enough moisture to keep it happy and to give me blue flowers for several years I won't say indefinitely because there's no indefinite with this plant it will it will do what it wants and you will be left wanting at the end of it however Stephen if you can't grow the blue mechanopsis poppy where you are may I suggest an alternative and it's the mechanopsis paniculata which is a yellow flowered one okay okay the flowers aren't blue I know you love blue you like a patica you like mechanopsis but this yellow one is very very nice and the great thing about it is the foliage is even more attractive than that of the blue poppy big soft hairy mounds now it is monocarpic so once it flowers it dies but you will have those mounds of beautiful foliage in your garden for several years before that happens and you can sow the seed and go again anyway that's my suggestion and i hope it's of use all right well thank you rachel for including us in your video and i'm now looking forward to some therapy because i'm going to show you the five plants that i can grow that you can't poor stephen is feeling a bit triggered but do hit the link if you want to see our video where we talk about the five plants that rachel can't grow but stephen can from top to bottom we'll find out what rachel's number one is you'll have to hit the link and come across to us but thank you rachel for including us and we'll see you all soon yes bye all so there you have it and what we all now have to do is to go on over to the horticulturalist channel to see the other video in this series so in that video you'll learn about the five plants that i would love to grow and can't but that stephen grows so well in his macedon garden let's go and have a look at that video now and thank you as always for watching and for subscribing don't forget to subscribe to the horticulturalists as well and i will see you on the next video who knows perhaps in the future we'll have a bit of a collab with matthew in terms of his orchids okay go on go look at that other video now bye